All right. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob McKenzie. This is my brother, Doug. Good day. Hello. I think that's the wrong script, actually. Uh, so anyway, welcome to History Happy Hour on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours website. Hi, Chris. Hello, Rick. Um, this is uh, kind of as much an adventure for us as it is for you. Um, and so here's the plan. We're going to uh, introduce each other, which should be amazingly um, boring. And then <laughs> Um, uh, we've prepared a couple of conversation starter questions to kind of get things going. Uh, and uh, we don't know what questions each other have asked. And then so we're going to flip a coin to see who goes first and then uh, uh, get started talking about history. And of course, you can uh, make your um, own comments uh, come in and be part of this. And uh, we would love to uh, uh, have them there so that we uh, kind of know what you're saying and what's going on. So, um, um, what can go wrong, Chris? Right? <laughs> Don't make television history, I think. That's why they is. separate us by, you know, an ocean. And... Yeah, exactly. So uh, well, we'll start with introductions. I'm just looking uh, here. I actually, um, yeah, people are on. People are watching. So that's oh, good. That's good. Um, amazing. <laughs> but they must really be bored. Um, so uh, Chris has heard me introduce him before, so he knows that he's in trouble here. Uh, so I'll start and say that Chris Anderson uh, claims to be of Scottish descent, also claims to be a military historian. I have seen written proof of neither. So a lot of nice books there in the background, Chris. Uh, he's from Boston, so uh, to use a phrase from the local patois, Chris is wicked smart, knows all that history shit and stuff, and um, uh, or as his wife has been known to refer to it, useless ephemera. And uh, he knows all about the uh, Band of Brothers, knows a lot about the Revolutionary War, although he insists on taking, for some odd reason, the British side in discussions mm -hmm. on the Revolutionary War, which may be why he's moved to London. Maybe. Got too hot for you here, huh? That's right. Um, so also, I, having traveled a lot with Chris, I can tell you that he appreciates English ale, Scottish whiskey, French wine. What's your beverage of choice tonight, Chris? Oh, I'm, I'm boring. It's just just coffee so far, but you know. So I've got. I hope everybody's got a beverage of choice. I've got a, a beer here. I haven't oh, yeah. drunk it yet, although all evidence to the contrary. Um. So, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Anderson. And uh, virtually next to me is Rick Meyer, uh, who knows a thing or two about the Ghost Army and the. Uh, their exploits in single-handedly winning the Second World War. Like me, he uh, is originally from New England, but then, you know, much like Tom Brady, stabbed it, stabbed him in the back and moved to Chicago, where he's now holed up in a tower overlooking all of his many minions. Uh, he's a great guy and a good friend, and I've enjoyed having him on some trips. And uh, we owe this, for good or for ill, down to his uh, initiative and technical acumen. So, Rick? Right. Oh, oh, that's good. Right. Technical acumen is going to be a real fail here. Okay, so we're going to flip a coin to see who goes first with asking a question. So, Chris, you uh, have the coin, right? I do. This is a uh, 50 pence piece. Oop, oop, oop. Is it anywhere? No, trust me, it's there. Okay. Uh, is it, yeah, I have trust you here. Oh, we didn't pick heads or tails first. We're kind of idiotic. Well, you pick heads. heads. Okay. Heads it is, or, or, or queen it is. Oop, oop, oop. There we go. Oop. All right. So it's your question. Okay. So um, you and I have uh, uh, spent some time on the path of the American Revolution, uh, traveling, uh, scouting out a, a new tour on that. Um, and my history book says that the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775. But I know there's lots of people who would say, no, 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 it started before that or it started after that, really. So I want your take on kind of when did um, – you know, shit get real as far as the American Revolution getting underway. Well, as we've discussed before, you know, in my opinion, it probably has something to do with the fact that I lived there for quite a while, that uh, the revolution really starts after the Battle of Bunker Hill. Because after uh, those first reports about the battles, uh, the skirmish at Lexington and Concord, um, there was kind of shock and there was... Um, People in Boston were wondering what was going on, and uh, I don't think that, that had really kicked things off officially, but it was after uh, the casualty reports from, from the Battle of Bunker Hill got back to London. Uh, the King and Parliament saw that, and they said, okay, this is serious. 
uh, and we're going to have to put this put this problem to rest that they sent over lots of forces, and I think that's that's when things got real. Um, okay. So uh, just an opposing view or really an alternate view, because I don't really disagree with anything you said, but I always kind of think that the revolution, uh, you could argue the first battle of the revolution is the Boston Massacre, uh, okay. March 5th, 1770. It is the first uh, 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 confrontations or violent confrontation between uh, British troops and American colonists where there's gunfire, where there are people killed. Uh, and there is kind of violence on both sides. And everything that happens, whether it's the burning of the Gatsby or the Boston Tea Party or uh, all of the things that kind of happen in the years after that, they kind of seem to uh, all come from the Boston Massacre. So, and maybe it's because I uh, um, shot a reenactment of the Boston Massacre once that I think so, but uh, that always seems to me like kind of a pivot point, a beginning pivot point in that. Well, I mean, I think it, it certainly, it's certainly a, a spark. Uh, it's certainly something that um, Paul Revere and his cronies made uh, made hay out of with his prints. Um, but I would say that um, while there was gunfire, it was, uh, it, 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 I would look at that as more of a civil disturbance than a kind of organized armed uprising. Okay. You know, and I go as far as saying, you know, when, when, you know, we we know it is slang now, but when the when the British came out, uh, out on the steps of the of the, the state house there and said, you know, read the Riot Act, they were dealing with a civil a civil problem at that point. I, I love the Riot Act, and I don't know if a lot of people know about the Riot Act. That the idea was that they were supposed to uh, supposedly the British troops couldn't fire until a justice of the peace had read the riot act of telling people to disperse and then they had an hour to disperse before the british could fire and that the people who were participating in these uh in this in this uh, uh event uh really thought and many of them that the british would not fire no matter what they did until the riot act was read well i mean i'm not a, I'm not a legal i'm not a legal scholar but my understanding is that the the british troops weren't even you know legally allowed to take action until that act had been read uh, except for self-defense. Except for self-defense, which is kind of what they argue. So we're we're dealing with our um, exciting uh, technical issues here, and I, I can see some of the uh, the comments here on Facebook, and they're not showing up on our little window here. But I just want to mention, say hello to a few of the people who are on: uh, Tara Levin, uh, Chip Young, uh, Dan Levitt. Hi, Dan. Uh, Kim Bell. Um, uh, Rick Fry says hello to you, Chris. Hello. Uh, and Dan Levitt says bagpipes. So bagpipes, yes. Uh, we can almost hear the Dave Childress is with us. Uh, Marilyn Ray Byer. Um, oh, there's a. I can do the drone part if you can do the rest of it. Okay. okay. Wow, the viewership's going down rapidly. Uh, <laughs> A Cassidy Common Commendatory, uh, Gary Ann Renchi, George Luz. Luz. Uh, what kind of socks you wearing, George? Uh, so we want to know about your socks, George. Text us about that. Uh, Paul Woodage, uh, there from in the UK with you, is watching um, with Mag. Mag is watching hey, with Mag. him. Uh, I guess they're in Normandy, although yep. Paul is. Paul, judging by accent, originally from the UK. It's a tough call, but it's my guess. Um, George Seibert, Harry Forsdick, Neil Shara, Mary, a lot of people, Chris, here with us. So that's really exciting. We'll get to shout out to some more people a little bit as, as we go on. Well, I hope, um, folks, and I hope folks post questions or things they want to ask us, too. Yeah, or your response to our questions. Yeah. Uh, so that um, you're more part of the conversation. And, you know, as we said, and we're joking about it, but we've never done this before. So we're trying to figure out uh, what works and what doesn't and how to make it go. So help us in any way you can. Uh, Chris, um, um, I, I'll say one more thing about the Boston Massacre. Yeah. Yeah. So um, funny story. I did a thing with Larry the Cable Guy. Do you know Larry the Cable yeah. Guy? Yes, we had a show on the History Channel, and he wanted to do a tour of the Freedom Trail. 
So I took Larry on a tour of the Freedom Trail with the cameras running. It's right. really amazing that I'm even willing to admit this to anyone. And we got, because it was a bizarre segment of television, but we got to the massacre site and Larry decided he wanted to do a reenactment of the Boston massacre. And he enlisted in this effort um, a bunch of Japanese tourists who were there <laughs> on the spot and who, I don't know if they completely understood what were going on, but they were enthusiastic participants and we um, reenacted the Boston massacre and I got killed as part of the reenactment. Because you and were causing a riot. Yes, exactly. And I think I was also, it was a very cold day. I was one of the people willing to fall down and lie in the street there. <laughs> anything, <laughs> for art, Rick. With all the, anything for history, man. I am on top of this. See, if I had been there, I would have walked down the street to where the British coffee house was and had a drink while you reenacted the Boston Master. Brilliant. Nice. That would be a good, good move. So, okay. So it's your turn to ask me a question. And, uh, and then after we go another round, we'll, we'll see what else people have posted here. All right, so we're going we're gonna to jump centuries now. All right. Ooh, and make so, some notes. <laughs> so this is a question that uh, actually Paul Woodage had posted on one of his uh, little talks that I thought was interesting. Um, most important battle of the Second World War. Oh, my goodness. Kind of total soft, it's soft uh, body. Um, you know, um, I'm going to say Stalingrad, the battle for Stalingrad. Okay. So I think that in general, the, the Russian front gets so little play in the West and we, people don't even know, people are talking about D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge or Midway and, and, uh, Okinawa and, uh, Iwo Jima. And here you have uh, the fighting between Germany and Russia that kills how many people? I don't know. 20 million, 40 well, million. Your number, many. Yeah. yeah, it was tens of millions of people. I mean, it, it dwarfs by a scale of, uh, I don't know, five to one or, or three to one, I guess, three to one, the uh, casualties on the, uh, in the uh, Western Europe with America and Germany. And Stalingrad is the battle in the second year of that war, really. So in the first year, the Germans almost get to Moscow, which would have been, uh, obviously, if they'd taken Moscow, they would have uh, probably uh, succeeded in their invasion of Russia, but they almost get to Moscow, and then they, they regroup. But, but Germany is still really strong. It's 1942, and Germany is still a really powerful military organization. They really haven't lost uh, a lot of places, except for that initial battle in Moscow. And they make a real amazingly aggressive push to attack uh, in Russia towards the south through uh, 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 the Ukraine area, and they get to almost get to Stalingrad. And uh, that the fighting there is some of the most um, awful fighting in the war. And it's the battle that really, I think, stops the German juggernaut and, um, and saves um, the Soviet Union to be able to then come back to continue increasing their production, increasing the readiness of their army, and then be strong in, in fighting in Kursk and then moving against the Allies uh, after that. So I would say the Battle of Stalingrad. So um, okay. what do you take? So, well, my, uh, my, t my take on it is that I say that uh, Pearl Harbor is the most important battle of World War II. Okay. Uh, because without Pearl Harbor, uh, of course, I don't think that America is going to be coming into the war against fascism. So America's entry into the war uh, makes it a world war. Uh, and that is that is the spark that gets America engaged in a way that they've never been before. Um, I also think that uh, it commits Japan to a war that it can't win. So it guarantees uh, kind of their overextension and eventual defeat. Um, and of course, as, as we know, um, Hitler is obliging and declares war on us. Uh, so we're now finally in the war against uh, Nazi Germany. Um, and I think so I, I think that's the that's the battle that, that makes it officially a world war. What, what, what happens? What do you think happens if um, the Japanese don't attack Pearl Harbor? 
do you, are you ever willing to go down that contra factual contra history hole? Well, I, you know, if they don't attack Pearl Harbor in a lot of ways, um, the, the war in the Pacific gets a lot longer because one of the, one of the byproducts of the attack on Pearl Harbor is of course, it destroys our Pacific fleet, but the fleet that it destroys is, is grossly outdated. I mean, it's a battleship fleet. Uh, and those, and the, the war in the Pacific is not a battleship war. So um, by sinking those ships, uh, the fleet that we build to respond to that attack is a modern state of the art fleet. Um, that's gonna, you know, eventually crush Japan. So I think uh, Pearl Harbor doesn't get attacked. We don't develop um, as potent and powerful as, and modern a fleet as we eventually do. I think we will eventually have war in the Pacific because Japan uh, they're on a pretty tight timeline. As long as we have that embargo in place, um, Japan knows that they have a very short window um, of fuel and other resources that they have to have. So if they want to continue their expansion and their war in China, which uh, in 1940 and 41 is really what they're most focused on, um, they're going to have to strike south into Indonesia uh, and take um, the, the French and Dutch colonies. As soon as they do that, that's going to persist, that's going to expand the war. Um, so there's going to be a war. Uh, it's just I think that by uh, attacking Pearl Harbor, that just sets a, you know, that that brings us in and, and gets us involved in a way that we wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, but but by, by by attacking and, and being so successful against our battleships, uh, it forces us to build a fleet that's modern and state of the art um, and built for the war that's going to be fought. And, uh, uh, and and quite an amazing fleet. I mean, I, the number of aircraft carriers that we had by the end of World War II was uh, like 120 or something. And oh, it's we had maybe yeah. four or five before the, before yeah, the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the output is just absolutely, it's mind-blowing. Um, yeah, the home front output is incredible. And um, the, the, the landing craft, uh, some 20,000 Higgins boats uh, are made, um, you know, and, and ships are made in all sorts of unusual places. There's a bunch of submarines were built up in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, sailed down through Chicago, down the uh, uh, Kankakee to the Illinois, to the Mississippi, to New Orleans, and then out to battle. Right. And in downstate Illinois, they built uh, LSTs, big LSTs, just, just small enough to get through the locks on the Illinois River. And again, sailed them down to the Gulf of Mexico and out either way. So they really had the whole country, you know, like wildly uh, geared up for everything that they needed. Well, and you know, the other thing I, I mentioned, you know, we're focused a lot on Europe with, with our trips. You know, we talk a lot about D-Day and, uh, and that campaign. But one of the things that I think should be kind of borne in mind is the global nature of this war. And we sometimes forget about that. But if you think that um, on June, 6, 1944, of course, we invade Normandy, a uh, huge invasion. Um, basically, a week later, we launch a, a, an invasion almost of the same size and scale uh, in the Marianas Islands. We, we invade Saipan with almost 100,000 Americans. Wow. It's, a, it, you know, it's, it's amazing. And none, none of the ships that carry out those operations had existed in 1941. The army that, that lands hadn't been recruited and trained and equipped the landing craft hadn't but none of it had been done before um so i think that um whenever we talk about world war ii and whoever whatever the most important battle was and that's something you can argue about endlessly just the i'm struck more and more by just the global nature of it you know and how immense it was there's a there's a quote from oh my god here, I, I'm having a senior moment. I'm not going to remember his name, but um, great British uh, 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 war historian uh, who talked about um, World War II is the biggest event in human history. Yeah. You know, fought on six out of seven continents and all of its uh, uh, oceans, all of yeah. the globe's oceans, and basically leaves, you know, 50 million dead and 100 million wounded in mind and spirit. John Keegan. Yes, 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 yes. So I want to call out some more of the people who are with us. Marsha Baker tells us we should both stop touching our faces. So <laughs> yeah. 
uh, uh, Harry Forsdick is here. Sean Lockheed. Uh, Phil Brzezinski says, bagpipes, please no. Did, did <laughs> don't worry. One more? Can, we, can we see the kill one more time, maybe? I don't know. Uh, it's in the closet. Uh, Marty Blundell Fry says, hi. Hi, Marty. Uh, Catherine Byerhurst, who's my sister and also a Stephen Ambrose tour junkie, is uh, with us. Uh, Julie Pickering says, uh, hi, Chris. It's Morgan Pickering. So it's not Julie. It's Morgan who's commenting. And Ronald Stassen, who is a terrific uh, historian, uh, World War II historian in Belgium, I believe. Holland. Is, Holland. Is Holland. Holland. Oh, my God. Ronald, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. He's just deleting all of them. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, uh, the McCord family is with us. And uh, George Les says he's got his five-pound bag right here. I do not know what that means. Oh, the, the Jolly Ranchers. Okay, so we're all good with George. And George, George Les is an interesting guy whose father was one of the Band of Brothers soldiers, and he's been with us, been with you on a ton of tours yeah. uh, in Europe. And, and we've, um, he's a fellow Rhode Islander, so I you know, always like uh, meeting Rhode Islanders. Um, so... Um, Okay, so are you ready for another uh, a softball lobbed in here from um, from Chicago? Well, yeah, but one thing I want to say is, you know, I know we're we're not getting any questions from people. Yeah, uh, you know, ask your questions and and hopefully um, you would like us to keep doing this. So you know, give us your suggestions for things you'd like us to talk about or avoid talking about or you know. Yeah, we, we like would love to some some feedback and and um, you know. Um, something to make it more than just two guys talking to each other, which we like doing. <laughs> so, 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 Chris, so and I, Chris and I have done two, we've done one tour together where I was uh, an assistant on his uh, World War One tour, which was amazing and, and fabulous. Um, and then we also, along with my wife, Marilyn, scouted the uh, Rev War tour back in a year ago, right? Just about, I guess, a year ago last April. So, I uh, you guys have invited me on his ghost army trip. Well, yeah, no, um, it's, I don't, you know, I'm a little concerned about what your attitude would be. <laughs> be honest with you, okay? So, because it's, I, I don't, you know, it's, you know, the ghost army tour, did they want to hear about Band of Brothers, Band of Brothers? I, you know, uh, that's true. Well, the that's, uh, it's a whole thing. Um, so this is about this is a question about touring. What about history travel? Uh, so you've done a lot of history travel, tours, scouts, personal journeys, uh, and I, I, you know, throw out kind of a broad category. What is the most uh, serendipitous surprise that has taken place on one of your trips? And if you are start drawing a blank on serendipitous surprises, you could go for. Um, kind of a hidden gem of a place that was better than you thought it would be or just kind of struck your guests in uh, you or you in such a positive way, but you didn't expect it to. Well, I mean, one of the, I guess, kind of one of the moments that always uh, struck me or serendipitous moments was um, doing a uh, Band of Brothers tour many, many years ago and I had uh, Jack Agnew, who was one of the Filthy 13 on the trip. Um, and uh, as, some, as most of you know, uh, Ag the Filthy 13 um, were regimental demolitions guys and they helped train Band of Brothers and they got up to all kinds of kind of insane and crazy antics. Um, you see pictures of them before the Normandy jump painting their faces, uh, like Indian and the Mohawk hair. Um, so uh, he was the, one of the veterans along on the trip. Uh, we were at St. Mary Lease, um, and I was explaining what had happened, and uh, a bus uh, pulled up. A um, bunch of folks got off. Uh, it was a German bus, um, and a young man came up to us, and uh, I was with Jack, and said, would you mind talking to my grandfather? Um, and I thought uh, this could be a potentially good or bad thing, um, so I kind of pulled this young German aside and I said, well, who was your grandfather? Uh, and uh, he explained that his grandfather had been in the 6th Falschenjäger Regiment, which is the German parachute regiment that the 506 had had a lot of very serious 
brutal, nasty fights with in Normandy. Um, very, very uh, intense. Um, so I was a little unsure about this, but before I could kind of, you know, stop it from happening, um, this <laughs> man had gone off and gotten his grandfather, uh, brought him up, introduced him to Jack, um, and Jack uh, immediately leapt up uh, and gave this German a huge bear hug, oh. which really struck me. And um, they spent an hour or more talking to one another. Um, and finally, I had to say that, uh, you know, Jack, it was time for us to go get on the bus. Um, and Jack basically said, go to hell. I'm staying right here. Um, I had uh, one of my guests stay with him. And um, many hours later, he came back to the hotel. And I said, Jack, you know, what happened? And how did you feel about that? And, you know, I was just trying to take it all in. And I said, how you seem very friendly with this person that you fought with so intensely. Um, and he looked at me as if I didn't get it, which I didn't. And he said, Chris, he was a paratrooper just like I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very, it's a moment of all that I've never forgotten. It was a, that was a pretty intense, intense moment. Very special. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's really an amazing moment. Um, and you? Well, you know, I don't have a moment quite like that. Um, I'm feeling small now. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, but no. Well, we had a fun, a fun, fun thing. Not quite as intense happened. We were, um, we were going to take the Ghost Army tour uh, the first time we led the tour. So, so funny story, which uh, hopefully no one, uh, you, you know, our boss Yakir or no one from Stephen Ambrose is watching or will ever see this. Um, <clears throat> but the first time that, that I led the, uh, Marilyn and I led the Ghost Army tour, we had not only never led a tour before, we had never been on a bus tour before. So we had almost no idea what we were doing, but we got through it. And that's a number of years ago now. But we had made arrangements um, to visit this church in a town called Treviere, where the Ghost Army artists painted and sketched um, their way through, uh, you know, in, in the, it was their first stop in Normandy. It was a bombed out church. They were very excited about, you know, capturing this. And we have many of those paintings and sketches in there in the film. And so I said to my friend Jacques, who has a, a um, Jacques Forcade, who has a B&B &B not far from there, I said, can you arrange for us to get into the church. And he said, yes, of course, I can help you, Rick. And then he said, you must be there at 8 a.m. on some such morning. So we roused everybody out at 7 a.m. from the Chateau de Quinville, which is an hour away. And we drove to Trevier, which is right near Norman, right near Omaha Beach. And we get there and Jacques is there. Not only is Jacques there, he's there with the mayor and the entire town council of the town. <laughs> and not only do they have uh, the church open for us to come in, they have put on a, um, you know, croissant and coffee event at the, the city hall, and with them, one of the one of the paintings that was done uh, in that church was a painting of a small boy uh, named Paul Grave. With them was Paul Grave's brother, and Paul Grave's brother didn't speak a lot of English, but but he. Um, he totally, you know, sort of connected us to the events of that time. And, and then um, uh, on a, the next visit we made to Trevier, uh, we arranged for the boy, Paul Prevé, the actual boy in the painting, uh, to come there at the same time. And he lives in a different part of France, and he came there. Um, and, um, and it was really amazing that here's this boy who had been, you know, nine years old or something in uh, 1944, who'd met the GIs, who had all these stories about meeting the GIs. And now... He was a retired old man, and he brought me something. I have it. I didn't, didn't realize I was going to do this story, but he gave me something in a box, and he said, "He said I'm bringing you a gift, and it it it, it comes all the way from America." And I said, "Okay." And he gave me this gift, and he and this is what he gave me. I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's a shrapnel. It's a piece of shrapnel from a probably a 12 inch shell. So probably a, uh, a battleship shell uh -huh. fired at the church in Trevier on D-Day uh -huh. that he as a small boy had collected uh, on D-Day and then gave to me. 
and very interesting flying with this in your yeah. budget. Different story. Um, but that was, uh, you know, that kind of moment, which, which uh, those are, those are sort of really connect you with the, with what's really happening with the history that's going on there. Oh yeah. I mean, that'd be, you know, every trip you'll have, you'll have those moments either for yourself or with your guests. And um, as we're, as we're, as we're going through all of this right now, that's something I missed because it's always a part of the trips that I really look forward yeah. to. No, no. Um, hopefully soon. I mean, yeah. we've promised not to get into current events on this oh. uh, uh, on this uh, thing, but hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, so a few more people. We have uh, 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 Scott Hansen is watching. Hopes to see you in the fall, and Excellent. you know we cross our fingers, Scott. Uh, Stephen Ferber is watching. I see. You. Uh, Julie Pickering says you got to bring up Jolly Rancher time. <laughs> Wait, what? I, oh, yeah, okay. Well, um, Rick doesn't know, so I'll explain. But George. It better not take long. Is this going to take long? No, it won't take long. But uh, George Luz is actually the star of the show on our trips. And um, George brings an ever increasing bag of uh, Jolly Ranchers. So whenever there's a lull in the conversation or quiet on the bus, George will come up and whisper in my ear and say, Chris, what time is it? And then I. Shout into the microphone really quickly. What time is it, everybody? And they all say Jolly Rancher time. And then George runs around and hands out Jolly Ranchers to everybody. So uh, Chris and I are both kind of having this little moment of staring at the screen because every comment that you've made that's been on the Facebook feed suddenly appeared on our computer screen all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've been reading them off the Facebook feed. But now they're on our screen, and it's like, oh, my God, we have a billion uh, comments. So we're going to try. So we apologize, by the way, if we miss anybody. Um, uh, George Les says, does anybody know what time it is? So I guess it's time. Yeah. Um, Kim Bell says, my fourth grade daughter was learning about the Boston Massacre before our state shut down. Any kid-friendly websites you know about? Uh, Kim, I will... I don't have one off the top of my head, but I will look for that. Um, um, and Paul Woodage says the most important battle uh, in World War II was the Battle of the Atlantic, and any other answer is wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Well, actually, Paul, we're going to rope you into one of these conversations so you can. Yeah, Paul, be prepared why. to be a guest here because we have that capability. Um, Daniel Levitt says Operation Barbosa is the most important event. Uh, no second front. Germany becomes a real problem for the Allies. And we apologize for bringing up your comments that came a while ago. The technology is, I think, I think I've been reading that all of these live technologies, Zoom, uh, this Facebook technology, other ones are kind of crushed with all the people suddenly doing stuff. Well, I think, well, you know, one of the things I think we maybe will do too is, um, we'll take a look at everybody's comments and that might be um, starter questions for next time. Or we might, maybe we can, uh, you know, if you think we should and let us know, we could pick a topic for next time yep. and then ask for, for questions uh, in, in advance. So um, here's some that I already saw. Uh, uh, Daniel Levitt says it was more quantity over quality when it came to aircraft carriers, that escort carriers were plentiful, but essentially death traps. Uh, Phil Brzezinski asks a question. So finally, we do get a question here, and I think there's more of them. Um, for the American side, who was the most important military commander in your humble opinions? So I don't think there's anything humble about our opinions, but Chris? Eisenhower. Yeah, yeah. Who was that again? Okay. Eisenhower. Go ahead. No, he's, he's, he is the quintessential figure. If, and you know those guys. Those of you who have traveled with me know that I'm a little biased in that regard. But um, he's the man that uh, keeps it all together, keeps everybody focused on target. Um, he's much more adept uh, as a strategist, I think, than he's given credit for. Um, and he makes those he makes those series of crucial decisions uh, that I talk about um, quite a bit. You know, he um, first thing he does as soon as uh, he's offered the command um, of D-Day, he goes to Churchill and he says, I will um, 
I will, I'll take the command obviously, but I'll do it under one condition. And that condition is I command everything, every plane, every ship, every soldier, every sailor. So if you look at the allied chain of command, it's a very clear delineation of who's in charge of what. Uh, and you compare that to the German plan, um, uh, the German order of battle, excuse me, and the, the German order of battle, it's like a bowl of spaghetti. Uh, nobody knows who's in charge, nobody can make decisions. And when it comes down to crunch time in Normandy, uh, that, that's a major, major factor. Um, he also, um, you know, he looks at the plan that Morgan uh, develops and he says that... Um, that would be General Freddie Morgan. Yes. Right? Your person my, my, yes. Um, and he says that, um, you know, the plan uh, as it's devised won't work. It's on too narrow a frontage, so we need to expand the beaches. Uh, we need more planes, we need more landing craft. Um, and he sticks to his guns on that um, over a lot of inter-allied uh, wrangling and, and back and forth. So that's critically important. Uh, he wins the battle of, uh, uh, of allocation of resources when it comes to the, um, the, the argument with the, uh, the air forces. Of course, most of the, the allied uh, air force leaders are, are bomber guys. If, uh, and the Americans certainly want uh, their the Army Air Forces to become a separate independent air force, and they believe that if you just uh, bomb Germany, you can keep bombing them. Uh, they'll eventually surrender, and the guys can land. Eisenhower says, "No, I need I need the bombers to isolate that battlefield in Normandy." And again, over a lot of screaming and shouting and hollering, he eventually wins that argument between uh, what's called the oil plan, um, which is bombing Germany, bombing factories. Uh, or the transportation plan, which is isolating the battlefield. Because Eisenhower insists uh, on what he has to have, and he wins that argument. When we land in Normandy, the Allies have total air supremacy, which is, you know, again, it's crucial. Um, he makes the decision to commit the uh, paratroopers over the objections of folks who say that they might suffer 75% casualties or higher. Um, and he says the mission is too important, and we still have to do it. Uh, and even with that kind of gruesome uh, prediction, uh, he, he commits the men, but what I think is a huge testament to his character is he then goes to the airfields uh, where they're waiting to take off from, and he looks them in the face and he wishes them well, which he didn't have to do. And of course, you know, his, his, uh, his final decision, which has got to be one of the most momentous in history. Uh, there you go. There you go. You know, when you think about the pressure on him at that point, I don't think there's anybody else uh, in the Allied hierarchy that could have held it together for that. And so that's why. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree, so I won't offer an alternative. I'll, I'll give a, a vote uh, as most unsung uh, commander uh, for Admiral Spruance uh, at the okay. Battle of Midway. They just made a big movie about the Battle of Midway. I don't know if Admiral Spruance is even a character in it, but he is the guy, and, and nobody knows Admiral Spruance. People might know Admiral Nimitz, who commanded the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. They might know Admiral King, who commanded the U.S. Navy overall, um, uh, and who um, is said to have said, um, when the going gets tough, they send for the sons of bitches, and uh, he was one. And they might even know Admiral Halsey, especially since he's mentioned in a Paul McCartney song. But nobody knows about Admiral Spruance, and he was uh, he was the escort commander for um, uh, Admiral Halsey's task force, uh, and Halsey had, oh my God, I, I don't, he had a, a kinetic condition. I don't remember exactly what it was. You know, he couldn't get out. What? He was, Pardon? He had some kind of a skin condition. Yeah, skin condition. He couldn't go out with the fleet, and he put Spruance in charge, and his staff was horrified because they thought, well, this guy doesn't know anything about carrier operations. And Spruance goes out and makes every single decision correctly during the Battle of Midway. And there's a series of decisions he makes where almost each time, um, if he'd made the opposite decision, it could have been disastrous. And he makes all the correct decisions. We win the Battle of Midway. Uh, in the newspapers, it's credited to the Air Force. And Spruance says nothing about it, doesn't write his memoirs, doesn't try to take credit, doesn't care, but uh, wins that battle and goes on to be involved in many others as well. Yeah. So, unsung commander. So we also have uh, 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 Magali Dickens. Right. I'm almost certainly mispronouncing that. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Michael says, Lewis says, um, comment on the action in North Africa where the American army learns to manage his force in a sizable campaign. Um, do you want to comment on that? Oh, well, I can. I mean, true. true. <laughs> no, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, one of the, if you look um, at the overall strategy of the war, uh, I think that our involvement in North Africa is really kind of pointless. Um, it doesn't really accomplish much, um, but it is critical. And why it's critical, um, again, it demonstrates our commitment uh, to the fight, but more importantly, um, it's a classroom. Uh, you know, we have not experienced anything on this scale uh, since World War One, and you could argue, even argue that the complexity of this surpasses uh, some of the actions in World War One. Um, so this gives us a chance to learn on the job, basically. Um, and for that reason, it, it's critically important. And it also, um, it, it, it lays the groundwork or puts Eisenhower in a position that will eventually kind of see him in command of Operation Overlord. Without North Africa, uh, none of these things happen. Um, and uh, one of the great tensions between the British and the Americans, of course, is um, the second front and when to get involved in the second front and earlier in the, early in the war, um, it's really the British that, that are committed the most. They're, they're bringing the fight to the Germans in a way that we aren't yet as we gear up. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of tension there, um, but, but we have to go to North Africa and we have to, we have to lose, got to lose lives and we have to learn on the job. And that's why um, it's important. One of the interesting political dimensions of that is that, um, you know, Marshall and his team really didn't want to go to North Africa. They wanted to have the you know, sledgehammer, the invasion of Normandy. And essentially, President Roosevelt, an, another guy who, who could make a good decision or two in his time, uh, basically eventually said, no, you have to let Churchill win this one. You have to, we're going to go to North Africa because we got to fight someplace. We can't not fight at all. They're not going to go uh, and invade. And so we're going to give in to, to Churchill on that, which I think is a really wise decision. It doesn't quite satisfy Stalin on the second front issue, but it does, uh, as you say, give Americans a chance to, to, to get involved. It's doing something instead of doing nothing. And probably the cross-channel invasion in 1942 or even early 1943 would have faced tremendous more difficulties than it faced in 1944, although that's that's an arguable point. But I think that um, you know Roosevelt's uh, decision to essentially say to Marshall, no, I'm not going to back you up on this uh, on this strong point of view. You have to to give in, and Marshall's willingness to do that is the important part of that. Well, I was going to say, I would add to that, yeah, that Marshall doesn't sulk, he doesn't torpedo it, and he says, okay, then that's what we'll do. He's not happy so, about it. But. So, okay, so North Africa. Um, uh, Chip Young says, talk about the Battle of Britain tour. Um, <laughs> you, you can, you know, do you, do you fly around a lot? Do you point yeah. up in the sky and say, uh, here, here a big battle? I will say the only thing I'll say about it is that what you're excited about it. Well, no, I mean, I'm very excited about it. Uh, before all the lockdowns happened, uh, I got to spend uh, five days in France um, uh, seeing sites associated with uh, the fight at Dunkirk, which was tremendous. Um, and one of the things that was very exciting about all of that, um, and that I hope to show everybody, is that there's a hell of a fight put up. Uh, by the British uh, and a little bit by the French during that, at the start of that campaign. It's not simply, you know, that the tanks just cross the border into France and then everybody runs to Dunkirk and swims home. Uh, there's an awful lot uh, to it. There's some really, um, really epic fights. Um, and it was exciting to see those and to see how um, they're kind of untouched and, you know, you can... Uh, we get a sense of the fight and the sites are pretty special. The other thing I think is kind of telling um, is we're going to start the tour um, in Arras, which is if you've been on the World War I site, uh, tour, you know, obviously you know Arras, but um, kind of one of the sad ironies, I guess, of history that um, the war to end wars uh, doesn't end wars. And the second round, 
um, happens on the same battlefield. So you know we'll be starting our uh, trip where you know we on site that you see on the World War One trip. And there, I noticed that there was another question that kind of goes along with that: is do I think that it, is World War One and War, are World War One and World War Two two separate wars or one one war? Um, and I fall into the camp of uh, it's one long war with a brief intermission. Um, I think that uh, World War II obviously is, is, is a byproduct of the unresolved issues from World War I. Uh, the questions of German uh, hegemony and, and Europe are really not answered. Um, so I, I, I look, at, at, look at it as one long war. So somebody had asked about that and I just wanted to mention. The, um, I agree, the, the History Channel did um, one of the most egregious pieces of disastrous history programming ever um, in a series that they did, which, which took that point of view, I think, correctly. They called it the World Wars. Um, and um, it was one of the most hideous pieces of history television I've ever seen. And I say that <laughs> as, as a history television producer who produced many things for the History Channel. And um, I am going on record. It's, and one of the worst things, I watched it, and Marilyn was like, I was shouting while I was watching it. But one of the, first of all, one of the worst things is, I, I don't think they even mentioned General Eisenhower. He, it was all, it was Pat, 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 Pat. I don't think Eisenhower was even mentioned. And then they stated that, that General Patton um, conquered Italy in three weeks. Did you know that? No. Because, you know, little known fact, which is that Chatton only fought in Sicily. But so I think what they were trying to say, that he conquered Sicily in three weeks, also wrong. There was a sizable bunch of British soldiers there <laughs> under a, a, a general named Montgomery, who Paul Woodage wants us to talk about. But I think we should wait on that and do this next week and make Paul come in and be part of that conversation. We can do that. Paul, um, okay. Paul we can do that. Um, and uh, and so I I don't know um, I I watched the History Channel go from you know kind of a place where there was a lot of interesting eclectic some good some bad programming on history to this sort of uh, evil empire of uh, darkness. Well, we have, we have uh, yesterday channel over here, which is not great but you do occasionally get some interesting stuff on ghost it. army was on the yesterday channel once the what yeah the ghost army was on the yesterday, oh, channel. I, I, so I love the yesterday channel well i have a question here from sharon katz and since you are the professional filmmaker rick uh what are your recommendations for the best war history movies besides of course the ghost army documentary Is that, there are other ones <laughs> well i you know i don't know since so, since so, <laughs> Well, I haven't now, are, so I don't know. Are we talking about um, uh, movies as opposed to documentaries? Uh, well, the question was war history movies. So I, I think that that can be can be movies. Well, well, first of all, every movie is wrong. Every single one, uh, and arguably including the Ghost Army film. Every film has errors and shortens stuff or expands, you know, focuses on three guys when there's really a hundred guys involved or contracts and, and uh, uh, puts things together. I'm stalling now. Let's just be honest. I'm stalling. But, um, well, I guess you'd, you'd start with, with World War II um, and, and people should jump in and, and say what their favorite movies are. I, um, it's, it's super long and uh, I kind of like a bridge too far though, which is, and I, but I'm into my uh, Arnhem mode at the moment because I was studying up on Arnhem recently in anticipation of a trip that sadly is not gonna happen. Uh, but it's a movie that, that was shot um, as was the longest day, you know, almost entirely on location and on the locations where stuff really happened. So when you're looking at the taking at the Nemegan Bridge or you're looking at the um, uh, uh, you know the headquarters that uh, that uh, the British Airborne have outside of Arnhem, you're looking at the actual places. And I think that the that the scriptwriter there tries hard to to stay true to that. It's a little sprawling. It's a little bit um, confusing in all the different people involved, but it's uh, to me kind of a rewarding film. 
Um, I mean, I'm a sucker for Patton, um, <sighs> but, but but Patton is the more the further I go from having first seen it, the more I realize how little it has to do with the way things were. And so it becomes sort of a touchstone that people might know this scene or that scene. And I like um, the performance of George C. Scott, but I, you know, have come to recognize the serious problems that it has. There's a bunch of others, but but you you can jump in and name one or two while I furiously think of some more. Well, I was stalling I, you, Chris. No, I yeah, yeah, you. it goes without saying that Kelly's Heroes is the greatest war movie ever made. Oh my God! Oh no, no, no. <laughs> So, so a bunch of guys uh, fighting the Vietnam War end up in World War II is what Kelly's Heroes looks like to me. I mean, they've yeah. all got long hair, they're shaggy, they're, yeah. they're, attitude, they're anti-authoritarian. It's ridiculous. It's a deal deal. Okay. So <laughs> you didn't like that answer. Well, I'm getting, I'm getting the serious look. Yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Not I, like uh, well, I... Along your lines, I am a great admirer of the longest thing. So I think that, uh, uh, as you say, you can't replicate a war movie. Uh, but in terms of a, a piece of film that captures the, the scope of the event and the importance of it and the emotion of it, I, I still, still think the longest day. Also, a lot of things shown uh, filmed on location. And one of the most amazing things about the longest day to me is the scene in of the paratroopers coming down in um, uh, St. Mary Glees. And we're not going to get into a discussion about whether he was hanging on one side yeah. of the church or, the other, or not at all. But but to, to see that scene and realize it was shot on location and that they lit a building on fire adjacent to that square to replicate the house that was on fire, and they actually drapped paratroopers into that square uh, at night to film that is just kind of to me one of the most extraordinary things and the first the first time I visited St. Mary Glees with a group we were we were having terrible problems with the video on the bus where I was trying to show them that scene from the longest day and we just got it to play and as that scene as the scene is playing we pull into town you sort of see the church in front of you and on the video screen, you're seeing the church and the fire and everything that's going on. And, and it was like a magic moment. Oh, yeah. But, uh, well, and again, uh, I think it, we're both about probably in the same age bracket, too, seeing that as a young person. That movie was pretty, pretty whizzy. We, we had, uh, you know, people mentioned Band of Brothers, which was yeah. a TV series, so I'd left that out. Um, and also I heard uh, the, the Great Escape. Um, which is, I think, uh, has always been a favorite movie of mine. Again, sort of the more I, I read and understand, you know, I understand all the variations from history that occur there. And everybody in The Great Escape is so chippy and happy and well-fed. Yeah. Uh, it strikes me um, as, as a little bit off, but I really, really did uh, really did enjoy that. Well, uh, go ahead, come. Say, yeah, my other two that I'd throw in there, uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai, just because it's a fantastic movie. Um, and another one I really like quite a bit is uh, Battleground, uh, Ryan Johnson. Um, oh, it's the Bulge movie. Yeah, it's very campy um, and it's very, you know, of its time. Uh, but the thing that I, I think is very effective is that all the extras in the movie are veterans of the actual 101st who had been at the battle. So they do things in the movie and they carry themselves in certain ways that you know only veterans would really know know how to how to do it. So I think they add some realism that uh, is missing from a lot of films. So I like that one. It's well. interesting that there is a whole uh, genre, I don't, probably can't come up with any titles at the moment, of World War II films, some of them British films, shot in the late 1940s or uh, early 50s where essentially everybody involved in the film is uh, is somebody who was you know a British soldier or an American soldier and they're directed and written by you know people who have a real physical visceral understanding of the battle um, and and some of them are are, are quite um, quite striking uh, uh, to be able to get to that uh, so we also had uh, suggestions of mash yeah. which I think is a, a terrific movie. Um, I really, really, really liked 
going out on the limb here, the movie Downfall. Yes. Oh, yeah. About right. Hitler's last two weeks. And it's, to me, very, um, and it's, it really stands up as historically accurate and uh, really a window kind of on a sort of a horrific scene inside Hitler's bunker. And of course, it's got the very famous uh, meme that's always out there with the, uh, yeah. uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, who he's, um, he's pounding the desk about Steiner, Steiner. <laughs> Everybody's done the, with the guy with the funny mustache. You can, yeah, you can look up the downfall memes and find out about that. So, um, Chris, we have gone 55 minutes. Wow. You think we still have uh, 57 people with wow. us? Um, and, um, you know, we can, we have a bunch. We have so many questions now that I think we're going to have to save some of these for next time. Oh, 12 O'Clock High was mentioned. Yeah. That's another, another movie. Um, Black Sheep. It's a movie I... Say I'm not familiar with Memphis Bell, um, but um, I, I think that um, you know maybe we should end on a high note and uh, thank everybody for coming. And what we'll do is we'll look through your comments, um, and uh, if there's uh, questions you've asked about, I know uh, Kim Bell asked about websites uh, can, for the massacre. If there's specific questions that we can answer offline, we will. Um, and if there's enough interest, if you think we should do this again, we we might change the time because we don't want to conflict with the Anderson Friday Night Movie Night there in London, uh, which is a big draw in the Anderson household. <laughs> well, especially now that the pubs are closed, yeah, it actually is. Closed. I mean, it's just it's stuff's getting real. Yeah. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, this has been History Happy Hour. Um, I'm Rick Dyer. This is Chris Anderson. We love being here with you. And uh, history rocks. And uh, keep on with it. Yeah, well, I just want to say thanks everybody for checking in. We did, we had no idea if this would fly at all. So the fact that some of you actually took the time out to come and listen to what we had to say made us feel feel pretty good. So thanks for that. And uh, we'll make plans Absolutely. to do it again. And Hopefully and we'll bring it to other people, and we'll so so you don't have to get tired of looking at just us. You can get tired of looking at other people as well. There you go. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. All right. Now you got to figure out how to turn it off, Chris. <laughs> <laughs>